This is Around the Farm, the podcast about all things ag, and I'm your host, Rick Myra. On today's episode, we've got three crop protection experts from Bayer to help us understand what we need to be watching out for as we get into the growing season. Let's get it started. Well, hey, this is our first roundtable chat on Around the Farm. First time we've tried this, we've got three different guests with us. Uh, excited to have so many experts that are going to be able to talk to us a little bit about what we need to be thinking about, what we need to be paying attention to as we get into the growing season as it pertains to crop protection. Our first guest is Eric Riley, who is the North American Selective Herbicides Technical Manager. Eric, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and tell, you our, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hey, thanks for the uh, introduction. So again, my name is Eric Riley, and I'm the North America Technical Manager for Selective Herbicides here at Bayer. And maybe just to kind of level set everyone and give a brief background on on some of my history. So I, I started uh, my weed science career back with the University of Missouri um, um, before I started working for Bayer. And I spent about six years uh, at the University of Missouri in their program. And and really, after graduate school, I got an opportunity to come work for Bayer um, in our controlled environment group, where I supported our local, um, our the global glyphosate and lawn and garden business. And then I, I transitioned after about three or four years doing that role up into the current role that I'm at today. Um, and so that's um, happy to be here and and uh, looking forward to it. Awesome. Next up on the expert list of panels is Mercedes Diaz, who is our North American Broad Acre Fungicide Technical Manager. Mercedes, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Hi, everybody. Well, thank you for the invitation. So my name is Mercedes Diaz. So I'm originally from Costa Rica. Uh, I'm a North America Broad Acre Fungicide Technical Manager at the Market Development Department in Bayer. Uh, I am a plant pathologist by training. I got my PhD in plant pathology from Iowa State University in 2012. Um, in 2013, I came to Bayer as a seed treatment scientist, where I support the seed treatment uh, pipeline, our Acceleron uh, platform. And uh, I stayed there like uh, for three years. Later, I moved to control environment, always working on, on disease testing. I joined the discovery team, where I uh, test different uh, mo uh, fungicide molecules and microbials. Uh, for disease control and disease traits. Uh, my current role, um, I moved to market development uh, early this year, uh, where, I, I, where I'm working with uh, foliar fungicides in crops like corn, soybean, peanuts, sugar beet, dry beans, and sunflower. Awesome. And, and hey, listen, Mercedes, I'm not going to hold it against you that you <laughs> went to the wrong ISU. As, as a proud Illinois State University graduate, <laughs> where we originated the red bird and y'all just threw a yellow color on your logo and put a tornado oh. underneath your bird and tried to call it something different. We won't hold that against you though, okay? Okay, go Cyclones. <laughs> <laughs> the last member of our panel today is Ross Recker. Ross is the US Soy Agronomic Systems Manager. And uh, Ross, go ahead and tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. I grew up on a farm in Southern Illinois, about 45 minutes south southeast of St. Louis. And I guess the short story of my background is I really just liked walking bean fields growing up. Uh, didn't like going through and chopping out water hemp. So I guess between that and really developing, uh, you know, interest in how weeds can evolve over time, I actually went to graduate school for weed science. And that's where I started uh, my career within Bayer, multiple roles, um, conducting weed management research. However, my current role with Bayer, which I just began last fall, is really focused on conducting research on the entire soybean agronomic system. So not just weed control anymore, but really that full agronomic package. Well, hey guys, uh, appreciate you guys taking the time. Want to get into the conversation. So, you know, as you look at the current environment, um, soil conditions, recent weather, uh, we had weatherman John on our last podcast and vidcast, and he was talking about, hey, the soil moisture is still higher today than it would be historically based off of what we had in the last year, what we had this winter, soil moisture is still high. Um, we've also had some really interesting weather here this spring in terms of a lot of rain out west in the in the northwest. It's been a lot cooler than we would normally expect it to be. Um, you know, Eric, as you think about what folks might be considering around managing weed, insect, and disease pressure heading into this particular growing season, what are some of the things that that you'd have them paying attention to, or, or trends that you think they need to be watching out for? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I've, I've had a chance kind of uh, over the past week or two to really kind of lean on some of our, our technical development reps in the field from all over the uh, the country. And and there's been a couple different themes, I think, that, that maybe I can hit on throughout throughout this to answer your question. And and I think uh, actually one of the themes that we'll start with, um, you know, I, I got the sense from a lot of our folks around the country that there were these really great windows of planting. And specifically, I'm going to talk about corn and soybean because that's what I'm most familiar with. But, you know, when we think about the, uh, the the Midwest and then some of our northern territories, really good pockets where they got in their, their corn and their soybean. Now, I think like any year there's going to be these 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 pockets of weather, right, that you're going to get where it's where it's too much rain, too little rain and things like that. And one of the things that I've heard this year is in general, OK, across most of the Midwest and the north, weed control has been outstanding. Most certainly got great activating rainfalls in a lot of growth situations when I'm talking to these folks in the field. Um, definitely places that did not get a good activating rainfall. So so maybe uh, the weeds, you know, sort of broke through uh, a lot of the pre-emergent herbicide programs a little earlier than expected. But in general, I think the trend here is good weed control this year. You know, on the flip side of things, though, um, we mentioned a little bit of the cool, wet weather. So I have heard a little bit more instances of some crop response that's out there this year, um, per- perhaps more than other years, and especially when you when you tie it into weed control. Weed control is so great right now, but we're hearing a, a few more instances of crop response. And I think really with cool, wet conditions, the you know, the plant kind of slowing down its metabolism. It's not all that shocking under those types of environments um, that you're going to get um, instances of of a potentially higher crop response. Um, I, I don't think you can talk about this year without some of the late frosts that came in. Uh, you know, I'm going to pick on, I'm going to pick on up north, right? So, so we've got some, some instances with our horticulture crops, you know, um, that were really damaged, you know, peaches, the cherries, the apples, the sugar beet up north in the Michigan area re- really took a toll on some of those crops. Uh, I know that we got um, quite a few instances of, of yellow corn down here in the Midwest. I uh, haven't heard a lot of situations about replant due to the frost that hit there really, really late um, this year for a frost, but uh, overall um, definitely a bit of a roller coaster this year. Eric, you, you're talking about that that soil moisture, the the moisture in the air, a little bit cooler than it normally is. Mercedes, anytime I hear wet and cold, my mind immediately goes to disease and, and fungus pressure, right? So, can can you talk to us a little bit about what what should growers be considering right now when they're thinking, do I need a fungicide application? What what should I be doing? So right now, you know, the these spring conditions are. Uh, great favor for the uh, seeding diseases. So the main thing that growers need to do is consider uh, seed treatments, right, for corn and soybean. So you can control the um, diseases like pithion and fusarium. Right now, those delays in germination due to the cold, the cold weather and the wet conditions are making the crop more susceptible to these diseases. So that's one thing that they need to keep an eye on. So also go scout their fields to see and do stand counts to make decisions in terms of you need to uh, replant or you know um, switch crops. In addition, in terms of uh, with all the, the rain events and heavy rain, the hail damage, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, damage on the corn plants, right? More susceptible to, to, to um, different stresses. So one of them is that with all this rain, uh, uh, there is an environment uh, favorite for uh, foliar disease spread, especially uh, anthracnose leaf blight, that is an early uh, foliar disease that, uh, you know, it shows in the lower canopy of the corn. Um, then uh, this disease develops uh, soon after planting and continues to develop until canopy closure. So growers need to keep an eye on it and uh, also uh, consider uh, if the pressure is very high, consider a early foliar application at the V B5 to B7 stage, especially in corn. Hey, Ross, when when you think about this from a soybean perspective specifically, in a year where where it's a little wet, where it's a little bit cooler, and in some areas, you know, we planted soybeans a little bit later than we really would have liked to, you know, as you're thinking about managing the, the soybean system, what what do you have uh, what do you have on top of your list for growers to be watching out for and, and paying attention to early in the season here? Sure, and, and when I think about this season that we've gone through, like Eric said, there really was that early planting window in some areas um, where soybeans are planted, particularly as you move up into 
you know, Iowa, Minnesota, probably got beans planted earlier than usual. And then other areas that got a lot of that rain that might have been have, might have been planted later than usual. Um, particularly for those areas that were planted early, I guess from a herbicide standpoint, you know, if you planted early, then got that cold, wet soil, uh, there's going to be, and in, in the soybean got off to a sluggish start, there's going to be a longer time from planting to canopy. And that, I think, really makes it important to practice the use of overlapping residuals. So putting a pre-emergent herbicide on early, and then in that post-emergence tank, also adding a herbicide that has residual activity. I think that's a good idea in most situations, but may be even more particularly uh, important uh, in situations where you plant it early and there might be that longer period from planting to canopy. For soybean diseases, you know, Mercedes already hit on some of those seedling diseases that, you know, if you planted into a wet soil and had that longer emergence period, uh, we need to be scouting for those, looking at stand counts. But really, as we sit here in the middle of June, probably any management for this year is probably unlikely, but you just want to be aware of the, that disease presence and how that might affect future years management practices, whether it be crop rotation, seed treatments, variety selection. Uh, a couple other key soybean diseases to think about. Um, you know, sudden death syndrome is a uh, can be a major impact, and you know the infection is occurring you know early in the season, but your symptoms of sudden death syndrome actually won't develop into late summer. Uh, those that infection and disease development is going to be favored by early planting, cool, wet soil. So once again, it may be the case in some situations, but not others. But once again, our management decisions probably have already been made for this year. Um, you know, what variety did we plant, and on in what field, uh, what seed treatment did we choose? But looking forward and into some future forecasts, some other important soybean diseases such as white mold and frog eye leaf spot, you know, that seasonal risk is probably really going to be yet determined. It's going to be impacted by the, the weather conditions that are going to be happening around flowering and later in the growing season. You know, let's, let's stick with you here, Ross, and, and transition a little bit and, and talk a little bit about, you know, some resistance issues that, uh, that folks have been dealing with over the past couple of years. As you, as you think about uh, potential resistance issues from, from a herbicide perspective, you know, what, what types of steps can farmers be taking to make sure that they're, they're getting the control that they need um, in, and they're ensuring that they're going to get the crop that they're, they're hoping that they're going to produce? Sure. Great question. And there's just, there's a multitude of things that we, we could point out in regards to herbicide resistance. If I'm going to pick out one thing to key on, it's that growers need to know what weeds they have in their field and what they're susceptible to, as well as what herbicides those weeds might be resistant to. Because one of the number one recommendations you're going to hear from almost anybody in regards to herbicide resistance is that you need to apply multiple effective herbicide sites of action within a growing season and really ideally within each tank that you apply. Uh, but to do that, you need to know, once again, what your weeds are susceptible to. So let's take an example of water hemp, a very common weed throughout the Midwest. And if it's resistant to ALS inhibiting herbicides and glyphosate and PPO inhibiting herbicides, you really need to evaluate then what to use that it's susceptible to. So from a pre-emergent standpoint, uh, you might be thinking about uh, group 15 uh, and a PS2 inhibitor such as metribuzin. As I talked about earlier, I'd highly recommend overlapping residuals, but then from a post-emergence control, uh, probably want to be thinking about working in a plant growth regulator or a product like glufosinate. So Mercedes, when we think about resistance, how can fungicide play a role in helping farmers to manage some of those concerns and, and get the most out of their crop? So uh, in terms of fungicide resistance, I mean, growers can preserve the long-term effectiveness and uh, viability of a fungicide by following five uh, different aspects that I consider as a plant pathologist. One of them is choose the uh, a resistant hybrid of variety. That's uh, one of the most important decisions that growers can make in managing diseases. Uh, 
many seed companies like Bayer offer a wide variety of, of her, uh, hybrids and varieties with different disease score, so they can act, uh, access this information and know what uh, what is the susceptibility of their of their germoplasts. Also, they need to scout their fields uh, very frequently to know what diseases are present in their field. Also, implement uh, crop protection practices to reduce the amount of residue uh, crop rotation so they can reduce the amount of residue in the field and, and that means reduce the inoculum of different diseases. Also one important thing is mix and rotate fungicide classes, right? Um, it's important to apply uh, more than one mode of actions so you can uh, um, reduce the risk of, of develop resistance. Having two mode of action most of mode of actions in tank mixes um, um, you can tackle, uh, tackle multiple diseases or, or tackle the pathogen in different, in different uh, 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 ways and have more broad spectrum disease control. In addition, I recommend the growers for sure uh, follow the label recommendations. That's a very important aspect because we recommend a specific rate or range of rate of, of, the, of, the, of the fungicide. And this is for a reason, right? There is a lot of science behind that. So if you spray uh, a lower rate as recommended or a higher rate, you can start increasing the, the, the chance of having resistance in, develop in your field, right? So follow the label uh, directions, the timing that we recommend, the growth stage of the crop, and also, uh, know what disease you are targeting, right? Additional to the fungicides, I said uh, man, man, maintain pro proper uh, fertility in your fields and use integrated pest management practices. You know, as, as we get beyond just, hey, what, what can I do this year? Um, Bayer has is, is always been an innovative company, always look to bring the latest and greatest and make farmers' lives easier. Eric, can you talk to us a little bit about what, what's Bayer doing to, to help some of these concerns and, and help prepare the market with new products and, and new best practices uh, to manage concerns around resistance as we look out into the future? Quite frankly, the industry at a whole, um, you know, are focused on creating the, the best crop protection products that we can for our customers. And, and really, I think um, as weed scientists, Right, the fight against resistance is, is is top of mind for all of us, and I, I think that that, that Bayer, like like many folks out in the industry and academics, we're, we're all fighting, you know, on that front line against that battle for resistance. So, really specifically at, at Bayer, you know, what are we doing to help, um, you know, develop the next traits and the next products? And really, I, I don't think you can say this conversation without putting in the words R&D, right? So, so the, the, the research and development part of the side of our business is, is just absolutely um, uh, a top notch, right? So we've got some of the best traits in the industry and our herbicide crop protection portfolio is as robust as anyone's out there, right? So I, I'm being more on the selective chemistry side of things. I, I immediately am drawn to our, our, our corn um, herbicide portfolio. And so when I, when I think about just, the, just how robust this corn herbicide portfolio it is, just to give you an example, you know, we have 18 individual products in our portfolio that span across 11 different active ingredients. And I know Ross talked about the use of multiple modes of actions. And, you know, we have six different sites of action in our, in our corn herbicide portfolio. So I think that just on a herbicide perspective, I can be confident that, that not only what's in our current commercial portfolio, but also some of the different premixes that, that Bayer is currently uh, working in our, in, our, in our pipeline at this time. And, you know, really aside from from herbicides, you could talk about our trait packages, right? And the new things that we're doing as we develop um, uh, trait packages. So really, I'll, I'll keep it more on the herbicide of things, but but yeah, that that's that's really what I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say when I work for Bayer is just the new products that we're developing and what currently is sitting in our portfolio. Yeah, can, can you help people to understand, hey, what, what am I getting out of that, right? I mean, everybody knows it's important to control weeds, but when you think about the impact that, that weeds can have on a crop, um, if left unchecked, I mean, yeah, if you were at a ballpark, it, what type of yield are, are folks leaving on the table if, if they're not utilizing all of those different tools available to them to, to manage all of the potential weeds that, that could pop up in the field? 
Yeah, that 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 is a that is a great question. And so when you think about you know what what a weed does and why it competes against a crop, okay, so th- this is really kind of weed science 101, right? We've got water, nutrients, and light, okay, and so that's what a weed is in there competing against that crop for. So it's extraordinarily important from a variety of different aspects and in, in yield, right, being the number one thing we think about with why a weed is in that field. Why do we want it to to not be in that field? And it's yield robbing. Right. So so when I think about, uh, you know, some just different examples that are in the literature, you know, I was reading a, a Purdue actually publication, um, giant ragweeds kind of near and dear to my heart. It's what I it's what I went to graduate school for. And so in some of the literature that's out there, you know, as little as two giant ragweed plants for for 110 square feet can actually reduce a corn yield by 13 percent. Um, it, it's even worse in soybean. Right. So as little as one plant per 110 square feet can reduce those soybean yields up to 50%. So you take a a really nasty, large seeded broadleaf weed like giant ragweed, and if that weed is not controlled early, which given its biology, it is, it's an early emerger. So if you don't control that thing early, you can see the detriments just in two examples of two different crops of what, of what is capable um, on those weeds. And I think that, um, you know, there, there are other aspects. Um, harvestability comes to mind too. And if, and you know, if you've got a, a weedy situation, are you going to tear up your combine? So there's, there's other things other than just the yield. It, it's, it's all of that stuff. Well, it's a huge issue, right? And I mean, it is. Ross, when we, when we think about timing, timing's everything when it comes to this stuff, right? What, what are things that farmers should be paying attention to when they think into, hey, what do I need to be paying attention to at different times? And, and, and what's the time frame I need to be thinking about to take action? Because uh, to, to Eric's point, if I wait too long, I've, I've already done damage, right? So what things should they be looking for? How should they be considering timing as it comes to, to managing weeds? Well, certainly you want to control weeds early, um, particularly in that critical period of weed control so that you are preventing yield loss. And in regards to timing of herbicide application, there's multiple things of things to pay attention to. There's the timing of spraying your pre-emergence application, hopefully getting it applied soon within planting or, you know, a few days before, um, because, you know, particularly in soybeans, if depending on the active ingredient, if you don't get it on soon after planting, you'll be off label. Um, So that's certainly one of the first timing aspects you want to pay attention to. And then in post-emergence applications, it it really may just depend on what your strategy is. If you're going to apply post-emergence herbicides that have um, activity on emerged weeds, you want to be scouting your fields um, to make sure that you're making that post-emergence application when the, the weeds are short. You know, they're just simply easier to control uh, then. But another strategy, as I was mentioned early, mentioning earlier, is overlapping residuals. And so that's a strategy, strategy where you try to never let weeds get out of the ground. And so that then it often becomes uh, more of a timing on we're expecting our pre-emergent herbicide to last three to four weeks. So at that three-week time period, we want to make sure we're applying that second residual in order that they overlap and we don't let weeds get out of the ground. Yeah, when we talk about timing, Mercedes, uh, timing is the name of the game when it comes to fungicide applications, right? The the appropriately timed fungicide application can be a life changer. What what should folks be looking for? What should they be paying attention to to make sure they get that right timed application? Yeah, so for, for diseases, especially in corn, you know, scouting your fields, Go look for those diseases, keep track of them, and then uh, pay attention to the growth stage of the, of the crop. You know, for fungicides, for foliar diseases uh, control, it's very important that the application timing is between uh, BT and R1, right? Th- that's a very critical time because it's when the time uh, of the grain field. So that's when all diseases can affect the, the, the yield of, of the crop, right? And also, these all diseases affect uh, photosynthesis and uh, affect the, the, the crop leaves. So, very, very important application timing. In terms of soybean, yeah, the same. It's like a diseases like white mold. It's important to spray R1, R1 stage, right, when the, uh, at the beginning of flowering, when the disease uh, will start infect the plants and before the canopy closure. Right, because later in the season, when the canopy is already closed, it's very hard to get into the into the stems with the foliar fungicide application, right? Uh, and also, you know, the application at R3 for soybean foliar, this is super important, 
right? Because it's the time of the reproductive stages where the 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 pods are filling. So plants needs all the the photosynthesis synthates and everything from the leaves to fill the pods. So super important. Pay attention to the to your growth stage and the disease the scalp for diseases. Well, team, we've talked a lot about things that we can do, products we can use, the timing that we should consider around disease management, around weed management. Um, Ross, can you talk to us a little bit about what tools from a digital perspective are you seeing farmers uh, start to utilize to, to manage these, these aspects of the operation? And, and even what Bayer is using internally to, to better uh, prepare themselves for research analysis and, and helping farmers to manage their, their challenges? Yes, yeah, certainly. There, there are many in innovations and new tools that help farmers protect their crops against pests. And you know, I've seen apps that are being used now to help with weed identification. And there's definitely digital tools in the works that are using historical data, entomological and or disease models, and even then this year's current weather data to help farmers make crop protection decisions. Uh, specifically, Bayer and Climate, uh, we're actually partnering to build disease prediction models, and then tying those in with research data to make local recommendations for farmers about foliar fungicide applications in both corn and soybeans. This is a really an outstanding partnership because you know, Bayer has many years of historical fungicide evaluation data, and then we also have the information on the corn hybrids and the soybean varieties and, and what their natural disease tolerance is. So, you know, how tolerant is the soybean variety to white mold or how tolerant is this corn hybrid to northern corn leaf blight, for example. And you couple that with the ability we have to produce new data, um, market development within Bayer, for an example, the organization that Eric Mercedes and I are a part of. We have a unique set of equipment of planters and uh, pesticide applicators, as well as research personnel across uh, the Midwest uh, really to effectively produce new data and that can look at interactions of disease management practices such as variety selection, row spacing, and fungicide application. So when you combine you know, these data, both legacy and new data that we're producing with climate's modeling capabilities, it really gives promise to, an exciting, to exciting future tools for tailored disease management solutions. Lots to consider, lots to think about. Ross, if, if a farmer wants to reach out to somebody locally to, to help them manage some of these things, who, who are some experts that are around locally that, that they can reach out to and help them to understand how they should be managing through, uh, through all these best practices? Well, certainly there's a number of field resources uh, customers can uh, reach out to. You know, one of the first steps often is to reach out to uh, your, your retailer has certainly they are well aware of these best management practices. Um, however, there's other concerns or other conversations that need to be had. Uh, there's field sales representatives that can certainly talk through, uh, you know, aspects of chemistry and aspects of pesticide resistance. And then there's even other levels such as the technical agronomists that support our seed sales organizations, as well as crop protection uh, technology development reps. Those are folks that are really great resources because they're actually conducting a lot of the research on these crop protection products, as well as in uh, transferring that knowledge that they have to our customers. Well, Eric, from your perspective, what, what are some other things that folks should be considering around best practices or, or items to watch out for? Yeah, look, you know, I think that, that Ross did a good job outlining some of those comments, but I think uh, maybe perhaps there's a few other um, avenues that we could consider that would that would fall into that best management practice category when we think about, you know, what are some additional steps that we could take to help sort of mitigate the spread of herbicide resistance. And and, and a couple of different things come to my mind, uh, you know, just simple things like keeping your field edges clean, making sure that, that the field edges aren't, aren't, aren't uh, you know, heavily inundated with weeds that are encroaching into your field. Keep those clean. I think just little basic things like cleaning the equipment if you can. If you know you've got some trouble fields or a field where you do have some, some problematic weeds, you know, do your best during the season and, and cleaning out those, those pieces of equipment um, is, is definitely something to talk about. Um, you know, making applications even to smaller weeds, right? So making sure that we're using proper rates, full rates, try not to cut rates. That's, that's not something we want to do, right? So using full rates of herbicide applications and make them on the appropriate size weeds. 
Um, you know, the, I know Ross has touched a little bit on the residual side of things, you know, overlapping residuals, but maybe to take that just maybe one step further here, you know, why do we talk about residuals? Well, I think it's perfect to talk about it here when we think about resistance, right? So what does a you know, residual herbicide do? And, and why is it so important, you know, for example, at the time of planting to put that residual down? Well, simply said, it, it just helps lower the number of plants that are going to be hit, you know, by that subsequent post-emergent herbicide application, right? So if you, you put that residual down in hopes that you don't have as many plants up when you make that post-application, that right there is going to help take steps in mitigating the spread of those herbicide resistant weeds. So I think um, just tack on a few of those things. I think, I think it's important to, to, to throw out there. That's amazing. I mean, Mercedes, as, as you come at this from, uh, from the disease aspect with, uh, with your expertise in fungicide, are there any digital tools that, uh, that you're seeing be used or developed that, uh, that have you excited for the future? Yeah. So right now, all those digital tools are amazing because, you know, uh, now growers can diagnose diseases right on the field. You know, they can use uh, imaging, uh, drones to go fly around their fields and recognize like a, a small uh, source of infection in corners that they can access, you know, by walking or driving. So they can go and, uh, and see those focus of infection and can also go and target at one single applica application there and be done with the disease, right? Like uh, before in the past, you know, they know that they have the disease later, right? When the disease was already spread on the whole field, right? So all these tools are, you know, uh, giving the, the grower the ability of uh, recognizing the disease in real time, right? And in the right, at the right moment. Also, um, they can identify very quickly using apps. We have a set of, 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 of images and uh, uh, a disease guide where they can, they can see pictures of the different diseases that affect the crops and uh, help them to identify why they have in the field. Also, uh, you know, all these remote sensors, satellites, drones, uh, not only help with diseases, but they also help the growers to monitor for, for plant health, soil conditions so they don't they know if the soil is very wet these conditions can favor the disease development right what is the temperature uh nitrogen utilization and more and more well mercedes you you open the door to the future so i'm, I'm gonna sprint right through it because man i like talking about what's coming next right and you're talking about this stuff of, of drones identifying diseases in real time of even a spray application rig having a camera hanging down by the ground so that it can identify and selectively choose which choose which herbicide it's going to spray Eric, as you, as you think about all these amazing innovations that are going to come out, where we're going to have so much more control, so much more analysis on the machine or in a drone in real time where we're doing this all the time, how do you think that this is going to change the way farmers manage weeds, disease, and, and their applications on their operations in the next two, five, ten years? No doubt, you know, you think of precision applications with drone technology, you know, and, and how cool could it be to, to really identify those areas of the fields where we, where we need to apply a different rate or the right rate of a herbicide rather than the whole field. I think, though, you know, at it, it, it times, you know, there are challenges. I think there are also watchouts with technology, right? So I think that, uh, you know, you, you want to be careful about how many times are you going across the field and, and, and sort of hitting a plant or how accurate can the technology be, right? So I'm so naive and I think we all are. We're just starting to learn what this technology can be. But I think if we don't watch out, you, you, you could easily find yourself into a practice where you're spraying the same types of weeds over and over again and you know what that's going to lead to, right? So I think that we, we don't want to use the new technology to inadvertently start placing selection pressures on various weeds. So I'm excited to, to learn about the technology. But, but also be very mindful and make sure we're following best practices even with a new tool. Well, folks, this has been a great discussion. Learned a lot about what we should be paying attention to, what we need to be watching out for. But I got to get it, get you out here on, on something a little bit fun. So as, as the world starts to open back up a little bit here, you know, we haven't completely relaxed social distancing, but we can actually get out and do some things again. You know, Ross, what, what's one thing that you're really excited to be able to get out there and, and do once, uh, once things get wide open again? I know from my perspective, I'm really excited for schools and daycares to reopen because, you know, with three small kids in the house, uh, there's not a lot of peace and quiet in this joint. But from your perspective, what, what are you excited about? 
Well, I've got a nine month old at home and so not always quiet here either, but uh, I'd say this activity might be a little bit further out for multiple reasons, but uh, once everything's completely opened up, I really like to take a herd of Cardinal baseball game. You know, I, I do miss baseball. It's It's been tough to, to not get to see opening day for the Sox this year, the White Sox, not Red Sox, just to, to declare there. Uh, I, I am in St. Louis now, but I, I come from the Chicagoland area. And I, I often have to remind people that the White Sox are a Major League Baseball team. People just assume there's only one baseball team in Chicago, and it's, you know, that terrible blue and red one. Um, but Mercedes, well, at least how, we can how agree about you? On what that. you what, what's that? So at least we can agree on that. Hey, you know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? Uh, Mercedes, from, from your perspective, what are you excited to be able to, uh, to get out and do? Well, in terms of work, I want to go to the field. I want to be able to go and, and go to the farms and see, and see what's going on, right? And go interact with the growers and the, my coworkers and, and, and tech development. But in terms of personal life, uh, I would like to go back to the gym to do sparring. I practice uh, Muay Thai. So we're not allowed to spar right now and hit each other. So I'm very looking forward for that. <laughs> That's good to know. If I ever need any bodyguard, now I know who my Muay Thai expert is and I've, I've got exactly. somebody to go to. So Mercedes, you are now in the Rolodex under protective services. I appreciate that. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> well, bring, it, bring us home, Eric. What's, uh, what are you excited about doing? Yeah, so I would echo what Mercedes said, you know, I, I think from a, a work perspective, you know, just missing not being able to see my research in real time. And I, and I've always um, value the time that I get to spend with our local, uh, you know, tech development reps out in the field. So I, I think that's a big miss for me. And, I, and I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to do that here in the very near future. You know, on the personal side of things, I've been a blues hockey fan. You know, you mentioned you're from Chicago, right? So I've been a blues hockey fan my whole life, and it, it is just destroying me not to be able to, to to go to my hockey games. And I'm really hoping that uh, the, the NHL, you know, we have the plan in place to open up this playoff season back up. I doubt the Blackhawks are going to be a part of it. No big deal. But I want to see what, what our blues can do again this year. It, it surprises many, but I actually, I, I removed myself from Blackhawks fandom but <laughs> when I was like 14 years old. So when I moved down to St. Louis, I actually adopted the Blues. So it's the only non-Chicago team I cheer for. And I, I am a little bit crushed because the Blues would have absolutely repeated this year if the season would have just gone on as normal. I've still got a lot of confidence in their ability going into the tournament here, but we'll we'll find out how that goes. Hey, I know that, uh, that you're all very busy folks. You've got a lot of things going on. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us on the Around the Farm podcast uh, for this particular episode. So team, thank you very much for joining us and uh, hopefully we'll see you on the podcast again soon. Thank you, Rich. Thank Thanks for having me. Hey, I want to thank our guests, Eric Mercedes and Ross, for joining us today. You guys did a great job helping us to understand what to pay attention to and watch out for early in the growing season. As always, I want to thank our listeners. We appreciate you downloading and listening in. For those of you that are FieldView users and in these challenging times need a little bit more support than normal, never hesitate to call our support line at 888-924-7475 or email us at support at climate.com. For more resources on how you can use FieldView to stay connected, you can visit us at www.climate.com slash stay dash connected for tips and tricks on how to stay connected in these challenging times. Our best ideas always come from you, so never hesitate to give me a shout on Twitter. You can find us at the at FieldView Twitter handle and then use the hashtag FieldViewATF. And while you're giving feedback, we would never turn down a five-star review. As always, it's been a blast, folks. We'll see you around the farm.